Okay, we're going to get started. Hello, everybody. My name is Jan Feldman. I'm the Executive Director of Lawyers for the Creative Arts. Uh, welcome to this, our third in our in, uh, LCA series of programs on the law of filmmaking. Uh, we were, we were uh, presenting this series in, in uh, close partnership with the City of Chicago's Film Office. Very grateful to them for this opportunity. And uh, just a, a couple of quick uh, points. Um, this this uh, program is is one of five programs. I'm about to find the others on my screen here in a second. There it is. Um, uh, it's it's the third in our series. The previous ones were um, a program in July on rights acquisition, and another one in August on finding funding for uh, for your project. And this one is on film distribution. Uh, the next one, just so you can write it down, but we'll certainly be sending you notices, is on October eighth relating to the assembling of your team in a film project and final one on production issues. So um, very happy to, to have a, another stellar panel as we've had in the, for the past two. Um, uh, as I said, um, I'm, I'm uh, Jan Feldman, the Executive Director of Lawyers for the Creative Arts and with me is my colleague, Chris Johnson, who's our Director of Education. Um, I'm gonna quickly introduce the other panelists in a second. Uh, they, just, so, just for some tech pointers, um, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A button. And if you have questions during the program, uh, by all means, uh, send them to us through that Q&A. Uh, we'll determine at our end if it's, this is a time to um, you know, interrupt the program and, and uh, pose that question, or we may uh, uh, leave it till the end. We're gonna try to leave a short time at the very end of the program for questions and answers. Um, if you don't if you have a follow-up question you want to raise with uh, Chris or myself, you're welcome to send it to us at our, on our um, emails. And uh, you can find those at our website at law-arts.org. Just a sentence or two about Lawyers for the Creative Arts. We have been in business for 48 years. We are the state of Illinois' only legal service agency that is directed entirely to the arts community. And we provide free, pro free uh, legal representation and educational programs like this one um, to the arts. So um, for those out there who are in need of legal help and who at one time or another isn't, um, please reach out to us again on our website law-arts.org. Uh, so with that, I'm going to tell you about our uh, panelists today. Uh, Lewis Black is the founder of Lewis Black Productions and something called South by Southwest, which uh, several of you may have heard about. Abby Davis uh, is the co-founder of a of a company that just started this June called Character. Uh, we'll hear more about Abby. Bob Hercules um, is Media Process Group. And Brian Andriotta, excuse me, Brian Andriotti is with the Music Box Films com Company. Uh, Brian may have to bop out during the, during the uh, program and uh, we understand and he may, may bop back in. We don't know exactly, but we'll see how that goes. We're happy to have him for whatever time he's here. Our moderator today is Jed Enlow. Jed is the owner of Jed Enlow Law Offices. He represents a broad range of clients across the entertainment industry, including those in TV, film, music, and multimedia. His bio includes legal work for the Pickler and Ben and Steve Harvey shows. Uh, we at Lawyers for the Creative Arts know Jed uh, intimately because he was, um, he's been associated with our organization for many years. He was a partner in the media and entertainment law firm Levenstrand and Glover, and senior attorney at Harpo Productions. Um, I'll just say that Jed is one of those Chicago lawyers whose careers have been intimately associated with LCA for many years, and we're very grateful to have Jed in his role as moderator of this educational program. So Jed, with that short, abbreviated uh, introduction, please take it away. All right. Uh, thanks, Jan. I um, hope everybody can hear me. It looks like I'm unmuted, so... Um, uh, first, just thanks to Jan and Chris and everybody at LCA for uh, putting this together. I'm, I'm excited myself to, to hear from this amazing panel uh, with, with great experience in, in distribution. Um, like Jan said, I, so most of my practice has been in uh, traditional television and uh, specifically daytime talk shows where uh, by the time I get involved, distribution is, has long been squared away and, and planned out. But, um, but now I am getting into more um, independent filmmaking and, and earlier stage development. So, um, so frankly, I'm really excited to hear 
uh, the, the perspective of our panel uh, uh, to help me adv advise my clients. Um, and we, you know, kind of going through the, uh, the topics for today, uh, you know, uh, I, I was thinking this morning, preparing for this, I, I have a 10-year-old son who says that he wants to be a YouTuber. And, um, you know, whenever he tells me this, I say, you know, great, go do it. Fine, you know, make a video, bring it back in. And um, I was thinking, you know, if you ever make something that's good and it's not just full of poop jokes, um, <laughs> I, all I would have to do is post it on YouTube or TikTok and I, I've distributed a film right there. So, and if, if for some reason it goes viral, it could potentially have a massive audience and, and even a revenue stream. So to, to say that the world of film distribution ha has evolved and changed, uh, I, th I think is, is a massive understatement and to, you know, help. And, and then you throw a worldwide pandemic in, in the mix and uh, it gets even more crazy. So uh, I, I think this is important, helpful info for uh, all, all the LCA um, audience and, and everybody watching today. So I, I think uh, just to get started, we'll go through uh, each of our panelists um, and let you each tell a little bit more about yourself and your business and, and how it relates to film distribution. And uh, I think we'll start with Lewis. Um, well, I'm a co-founder of South by Southwest, although I'm not involved. And I'm a film producer, and I founded the weekly in Austin called the Austin Chronicle. I was editor for 35 years, but retired from that. I think the most interesting thing about what we're talking about here is 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I, I have dear friends, Jonathan Demi, uh, Rick Linkletter, people like that. And they always had four or five films in development because they didn't know it was going to take off. And you always had it, and almost always was the one you cared about the least that happened. But now it's different. You have relationships with four or five platforms, whether it's um, a cable platform or something else, because more than ever now, it's not the studios, it's distribution that's running the show. You know, even uh, 15 years ago, an indie film with one or two stars could make money. Now, every, every film is unique, everything is different, and, and more than ever, you have to be aware of the, your distribution options the whole time. I mean, you should be finished the film, and then you pray and call Michael Barker up and remind him about what close friends you were, which, by the way, you <laughs> um, but it's not like that anymore. And I think that um, it's, uh, it's really scary. Mm -hmm. Because it, it makes the film a product. All right, I think we'll move to, to Abby next. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Davis. Um, as Jan shared, I'm the founder of Character, which is a consulting and producing company. Um, however, I think probably the part of my career that we'll be exercising and talking most about today were my years when I was an agent. Um, I spent a significant time at a company called Preferred Content under a man, Kevin Iwashina. Um, where I essentially was um, a producer, but also a sales agent for several titles, primarily in the uh, documentary space. Um, to Lewis's point, when I started as an agent, Netflix was kind of brand new in terms of a streamer. And at the time, the company that I worked for um, produced Jiro Dreams of Sushi, a, a very now popular doc, but at the time, people didn't really care about documentaries and no one really knew what Netflix was. And so getting the unique experience to see this whole wave of streaming happening happen and occur within the last like seven to eight years has been incredibly interesting and to Lewis's point everything is kind of changing again now market wise so um, hopefully we have a lot to talk about and knowledge to share and dispel some of those market myths that everyone likes to speak as if they're truth but we all know they're not. So thanks for having me. <laughs> All right, and uh, Bob Hercules. All right, hello everybody. I'm Bob Hercules. I'm a co-owner of Media Process Group. It's we're a production and post-production company in Chicago. We're actually celebrating our 35th 
anniversary this year. What a year to celebrate it. Uh -uh. Um, <laughs> I am a uh, independent filmmaker as well. And so we, we do both commercial work and independent documentaries. I guess my most famous film is a film I did four years ago. I co-directed called My Angelo and Still I Rise. And I'm happy to also tell you that just one quick plug. I have a brand new film that just came out on Friday. It's called Mikva. Democracy is a verb, and it's about the legendary congressman, judge, and White House counsel, Abner Mikva. So I hope you can watch it. It's on the Cisco, Gene Siskel Film Center website. You can stream it. So, and my thoughts are concurrent with you guys as well, that distribution has, it's hard to even calculate or put into words how much it's changed since I started in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, you know, I've always been a documentary filmmaker, so... Um, Things have gotten a lot better for documentary filmmakers, obviously, but it's still a very confusing world. And I think things are still shaking out and now COVID has thrown everybody for a loop as well. So it's a lot to talk about. So thanks. All right, and uh, Brian Andriotti. Hi there, I'm Brian Andriotti. I am the head of acquisitions and theatrical distribution at Music Box Films. Um, Music Box Films is a Chicago-based distributor of independent cinema, primarily foreign language, although we've done a fair share of uh, English language independent films and documentaries. Um, Music Box Films uh, began in 2007. Prior to that, um, its origins were in the Music Box Theater where I continue to work as well. Um, I've been programming the Music Box Theater um, since uh, I don't know, like the late 90s. Um, and so my career began in, well actually prior to that I was working with the Chicago Film Festival, but my professional career began with uh, an exhibition and then continued an exhibition and added uh, the distribution component. And yeah, things have, it's crazy how much it's changed and the past six months have been a nightmare. <laughs> you know? um, uh, I have an ulcer and uh, <laughs> dr drinking heavily. No, I'm, I'm kidding. But um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, and I'm seeing it, of course, this, when the theater shut down nationwide, Music Box Theater was one of them. And uh, we, so we have two businesses uh, in the in the industry that are struggling to figure out how to make things work in this in this crazy uncertain time, and then figure out what's next. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. But um, I'm sure there's lots for all of us to talk about. Well, and and maybe Brian, uh, since I, I know you could have a um, have to drop out, maybe we stick with you. And especially, you're you're the only distributor on our panel, so I think everybody would love to hear first how you find your your films, what you're looking for, um, and and how has your process changed uh, because of COVID. Yeah. In that respect. Sure. Well, we find most of our films from a select number of film festivals, including South by Southwest and, and uh, especially international festivals, because we really got our start in foreign language. And so Cannes is an important festival and uh, Toronto and um, uh, Sundance. Um, and so we attend those, or at least we did attend them when they were still in-person events. Now we have been attending the, the, the can, can and, and Toronto were both had virtual components. Um, so we send a team and we watch films there and sometimes we receive links. Um, we tend to focus on um, films that are represented by sales agents. Um, there are hundreds of sales agents, um, but we've gotten to know a few very well and we kind of rely on them. They know our tastes, we know their tastes. And so we, in addition to seeing films randomly at a festival, we're, we pay close attention to the films that are represented by a select number of sales agents. Um, 
what we look for in a film. We, you know, we're a relatively small distribution company. Um, obviously, we're not as big as like the, the, the studio divisions like a Sony Pictures Classics, but we're not even as big as an, an A24 or a Neon. Um, and so we have to take a different approach. We, we don't uh, participate in bidding wars. Um, we look for films that we think we can help find its audience without having a huge uh, P&A budget. Um, and so we rely very much on advanced press from key critics. Um, we rely on directors' reputations. We rely on a festival pedigree, if, especially if a film won, you know, a jury prize at Cannes or something. Um, that can do the heavy lifting for us as long as we can get a, a good critics quote out and, and uh, mention that it was in Venice. We've already kind of started to tap into the audience we need to. Now it doesn't end there. We do, we do hire publicists, we do spend money on advertising, we do grassroots, um, but generally um, we have to be a little more innovative um, and cost efficient um, when we release films. So, so we look for films that um, have those elements kind of baked into them um, or maybe they have a star, you know, the foreign language star people might recognize, or there's an interesting premise, you know, a log line that could sell itself um, is helpful as well. You know, how, I don't even know if I, that's the big picture. I mean, it, it, things kind of fall apart when we start to enter the, uh, the age of coronavirus. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I, I was going to ask, so, so now, you know, since, the festivals are are not happening. How how are you? How are you going through your process now? Yeah. And do you see long term, you know, changes from this that are going to endure past, hopefully past the pandemic. The pandemic. Yeah, I'm pretty sure things will never be the same. Uh, not only with festivals, but in distribution and in exhibition. You know, I. Sad to say, I think we'll lose a lot of theaters, a lot of independent theaters. And, you know, that's who we rely on. We, our, our films do play uh, occasionally in the AMCs or the, the Regals, but more often than not, they're playing individual, independently owned theaters and cinema techs or the landmark chain, which specializes in art house product. Um, but inevitably, I'm afraid some of those many of those may not be with us. And then that's, so that's gonna change the, you know, how we can introduce a film uh, to an audience. You know, it, traditionally, the theatrical release has always been a loss leader. Um, you go into the theatrical release, assuming you're gonna at best break even, but more likely than not lose money. But what you've done with that release is um, elevated its profile so that when it comes out on DVD and transactional, um, people are aware of it and that's where, and because that part of the business is less expensive, hopefully that's where you start to see your profit. And it may be 10 years, 15 years before that you actually are in the black, but hopefully it happens. So, so the, the, I guess what I'm saying is um, that the actual component is now not there and there's no, we don't know when it will return and what it will be like when it returns. And so it really is kind of thrown us for a loop. We, just briefly, we, you know, we had one film in, in the marketplace about six weeks in before the pandemic caused things to shut down. And uh, we were still on screen in New York and a couple other major markets, but the release was definitely winding down. And then when theaters closed, there was this move to virtual cinema. Um, it, some of um, other people, other distributors like Kino Lorber and Oscilloscope began to come up with this new idea where we'd offer it via streaming, but only to a particular theater. And that theater would then market that film and that streaming opportunity to their base in chair in, with the cut of the cut of the, um, the profits. And so we did that with that film we had in release. We, we, we did that and the results were good. Um, and people began to think, you know, well, maybe this is a, a new normal. Once theaters return, will virtual cinema still be a thing? Um, is it viable? What we found though since then is that the numbers continue to go down. So it's, it's, it's not a solution. Um, and so I, back to the big 
question, you know, is like as a distributor, um, when you've come to rely on the theatrical release as the major component in how to market a film, um, and now that piece has been, is in doubt, it really kind of changes the whole way we have to approach our business. Okay. Um, well, and, and kind of staying along the same lines of talking about fest, the festival world, um, Lewis, maybe you can um, chime in as far as the, um, you, you know, I, I think there's some plans to do a, a virtual, some type of virtual version of South by Southwest. Do you think that this is, is a, an enduring change? Do you, and do you think that, um, where, where do you see kind of the festival world going as far as, as film distribution and shopping? Well, thank the good Lord, I'm no longer involved in day-to-day -day with South by because the last six or eight months would have killed me. I mean, I, I know what it must be like. They had to lay off everybody. You know, they had to cut costs. They're trying to survive. Um, and I think they are going to go virtual this coming year because I, there's not a, a big enough window to plan live. I mean, even if January things were great, you couldn't do anything. But I think... One of the things about South by is four guys worked it up and we didn't even get entirely what it was, but it's been such a privilege. It improved function. When record companies went away, South by was a great place to meet. Um, one of the most important things South by did was provide access. Before we started South by Southwest, young filmmakers and young musicians had no way, most of them didn't know anybody in the business. They had no way. It was a painful process to even audition. And, and South by, and a lot of other events, not just South by, opened that up. I think that you'll see um, the festivals return because I think they serve a function that can't be served other ways, which is to see, here are a number of great acts at the same time, see a number of great films, and be able to make choices. Um, well, I once was a judge at a film festival, and it was four days of shorts. And the one we chose to win, 48 hours later looking at it, I was in shock. <laughs> it was a terrible film, but it was completely different than the four days worth of films we had seen. And it, was, um, it, was, it wasn't terrible, it was functional. But it was kind of like, it was an aberration. I, I think that a festival, instead of, of limiting choices, expands choices. I think it expands the market. I think it expands word of mouth. You know, plus it's my income, so I'm hoping. <laughs> Does anybody else want to kind of weigh in about the, the virtual marketplace for, for film distribution right now? Right. Um, I guess what I would say about that is that from a sales perspective, uh, we're very happy that at least the virtual market still exists because like Lewis is saying, at least that access piece is still being provided. Um, however, the downside from a sales perspective is, is that there are just certain films that screen beautifully with an audience at a festival. And oftentimes, especially from a documentary perspective, I would utilize that as momentum um, as the sales process, you know, there are buyers in the room, there are, there are filmmakers in the room, there's also normal people in the room because it's a festival. And all of that feedback that you get because you're screening in a festival setting um, is really valuable. And so that's the part right now that when you are pitching these movies and buyers are hearing about so many at once, oftentimes when you have that audience intel that a festival gives you, it does become incredibly helpful. And we just don't have that right now yeah i would agree with abby i mean if, for, as a filmmaker it's it's a drag of course it's a bummer i mean you get you release a film and you can't you can't feel it with an audience like you normally would and also it eliminates a lot of opportunity to maybe if you haven't sold your film already some certain festivals of course are also marketplaces so uh you don't have that um in-person you know contact with various agents and distributors and companies and things like that. Uh, I don't, what you have is what we have right now. So it's, it's not satisfying to, sh to release a film right now with 
under COVID, but this is one of the many, I mean, I almost hate, I don't want people to feel sorry for us because there's so many other more serious problems due to COVID, but this is one of them. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, th I think I'll throw out just a, a very general question to the group for anybody to take, but um, one of the things that I encounter with kind of young, um, or not necessarily young, but, you know, um, new filmmakers um, is, you know, they often have a concept and, and they come to me and they have a, a great plan for how to make a film and we get to what's your plan for distribution? What's your strategy? And their answers are so open-ended and, you know, it's essentially, I, I want everybody to see it. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> you know, so anything would be fine as far as distribution to them <laughs> and, and, and the best, um, you know, they, they obviously want the most, um, well, in most cases, want the most eyes on it that they can get. So, um, from your perspective, what, how specific should um, a filmmaker be early in the process about about their strategy for distribution, and and just what advice can can you give them in their early planning stages to um, to find distribution? You know. Thinking of where you're going, how you're going to distribute your movie and exhibit your movie is crucial, and a lot of filmmakers don't do it. And and I had two experiences: one where it was an indie narrative, and the ending was unhappy because that's the way the director wanted it to be. But the actors and everything else drove for a happy ending. And I'm not saying it would have been a box office hit, but it would have done better. It would have had more, you know, more mileage because it was really charming and it, it worked out and, and the female lead turned out to be much stronger than the male lead, but he was invested in the male lead. And so you watch, that was squandering. Another one was a film that actually won Peabody and did very well, a documentary I was involved with, but I hate where it ended. It, it went on 20 minutes after where it should have. Mm -hmm. And um, and Jonathan Demi, who was a dear friend, uh, I both kept trying to, Talk the filmmaker into ending it early, and he wouldn't. But of course, when it won an Emmy, uh, Jonathan wrote me and said, "Well, we're both um, duty heads, so because um, it's a very sophisticated term." But still, I think the film would have been better the other way. So it's really like, you know, you run a ground friends with John Sales, and every film should be two hours or under. And John edits all his own films, and they come in at two hours and one minute, two hours and four minutes. You know, and you just think, John, cut out five minutes and make the distributors happy. But that's not John's motif. Yeah. Um, I think the advice, just the most general advice I would give to people when they're um, at the beginning of the process, especially, is it's okay if you don't know exactly what you want to achieve with distribution. However, have the conversation and have it consistently throughout the process. There's usually three things that people care about. It's making your money back or making revenue, eyeballs and impact. And those three things will change in terms of priority, oftentimes from the beginning of the process to the end of the process. Um, so just continually talk about it because what I find the most often happens is that this conversation about distribution and festivals is literally had at as a last step and oftentimes that's where you run into several problems um a big part of that is because the business side of our industry is really not taught in film school um it's just kind of something that people assume they should know or that they'll pick up along the way and then when you get to that point in taking your movie out to the marketplace people find themselves with no information and no one to help teach them or guide them. And I'm sorry to say this, but oftentimes sales agents, they don't want to teach, they don't want to help, they just want to sell your film. And again, that breakdown in communication becomes really problematic uh, because it's a really scary part of the process to enter the marketplace and festivals and start talking to buyers when you've never done it before. And so 
the second piece of advice at the end of the process, when you're entering sales distribution and festivals, if you don't know, and if you have questions, always ask, always, always, always ask. Again, the agent you're working with will probably not be very forthcoming about this is what's next, this is what's next. But if you sit and you ask and you're very direct and transparent about what you don't know, that has been when I've seen in my experience, the most positive experiences with distribution and festivals and things like that. Um, I think that there's this like um, myth that exists among filmmakers and producers that you should just know this stuff. And that's just not true. Uh, if you've never done it before, if you, how would you know? And this is a part of the business that is, that is extremely confusing because it's always changing as we're, as we're talking about right now. And so um, if you don't know what a marketing cap is, if you don't know what an MG is, if you don't know these things when you get an offer from a buyer, please, please ask. I'd like to add that um, the, there's a line that's blurred now between the distributor and the producer, the, the funder of the film, often they're the same now. So we're pitching, my company, we're pitching films to the streaming services directly to Netflix, Amazon, Apple Plus, et cetera. And they would then you know, fund the film and they would also distribute the film. So that's a very different uh, ball, you know, it's a very different model, I guess. So that's something, what I would encourage people to do to think about your project, your film, and what is the best fit for it? Um, and start thinking about that as far in advance as you could, um, because it, it's a waste of time to pitch a, a film that you're working on to somebody who doesn't, some streaming service or network or whoever that doesn't do those kind of films. So that's, that's something I find young filmmakers, and I did myself, uh, made that mistake. You're just like pitching it to everybody. I think it, it'd be better to target who you're pitching to for distribution. And sometimes the distribution is the funding increasingly. So, uh, you know, Netflix has so much money, um, but others, it's difficult to fund for documentaries. It's difficult to fund them, um, except for some of these streaming services. Yeah, I, I could just add, you know, I'd reiterate a lot of what everyone's said. I think, um, you know, the, the more you know your audience, the more you're thinking about the audience for your film and the better you can identify them and describe them, um, the better. And uh, because that's what a distributor is going to want. They're going to want to get to the target audience. And if you were to come saying, I know who my audience is, and it's not just vague, it's just not, you know, some, they're between the ages of 18 and 65. Uh, mm -hmm. They're both you know, they both live in the South and in the North, uh, you know, um, the more specific you can get it. And if you have a plan, um, in your mind, a plan to get to those people, you know, that's, you're, you're bringing more to the table than just your film. You're bringing, you're, you're showing that you've been thinking about how to market it and how to find its audience. If you can come, if, if your film comes with a, a network already in place, you know, maybe you started, uh, documenting the, the, the making of your film on social media and you've gathered followers and, and uh, begun to develop a, a social media presence, that's a tool you can hand off. If you've, if you've made partnerships with, you know, perhaps some of your funding came from some local business and, and they've committed to, um, once the film is done, to making sure that everyone on their list knows about your film. Um, you, know, you know, I get pitches we don't take unsolicited pitches at the film company, but I do get emails uh, to Music Box Theater from independent filmmakers saying, hey, I just completed my film. Will you show it at the theater? And, you know, I, have, I ask, like, well, what is your plan? What is your marketing plan? Have you thought about how you're going to release it? Are you going to release it in New York first? Or are you going to start in Chicago? And, and who are you going to uh, – how are you going to publicize it? And, and how are you going to get an audience in? And so um, – the the more you think about that, the better. And sometimes it's that, that kind of advice sounds like it's going to prohibit your creativity. You know, all that matters is I make a great film and, and my vision um, is up on the screen. And I don't want to discourage that kind of thinking, but um, there also has to be a, more of a, a practical element to it. Um, you know, I was to say that for a distributor, the more materials you can bring, and by that I mean basic materials, like uh, a good on-set photography. Um, you know, the, what 
a distributor in order to dis to market their film needs to produce a good trailer and a good poster and and have a good publicity set and sometimes we we're interested in the film but we see the materials that are we have to work with in order to market it and they're just not up to par and so so that's something um to consider and uh, yeah i think the more you know about the different distributors that are out there and the more you know about what kind of films they specialize in and the more you know about the way the various ways films are released you know so if they go wide if they go on a platform release um what markets would you recommend a film start in maybe new york and your hometown to to build up the per screen average and then that will open up opportunities in other markets um just some just some thoughts yeah um well so i want to touch on one thing so abby and brian both brought up uh the role of the sales agent and um and obviously playing playing an important role so um and when i hear that um as as a as an attorney for my client i think well there's somebody else taking a piece of the pie so um one uh, how do you get a sales agent and and what um, what are the standard terms you should be looking for in that in that arrangement and, and it, for anybody who I think one of the things to be most careful about is sales agents take basically two kinds of projects on one well maybe even three one they think the film will do well two they're really passionate about the film or three, they need to make a living. And uh, sales agents were really tight with me. You know, early on in Southbound, we didn't know what we were doing. We were naive when we started. would call me up to tell me I really need to take this film. And eventually I realized it was because they were being paid by the filmmakers, you know, and, and you just stop listening. But for young filmmakers, you can meet somebody who's a really well-known sales agent and get an okay deal that's going to go nowhere. So you really have to vet the sales agents. There's a lot of them out there and some of them are very good, but a lot of them, I mean, the real problem is they start working with two or three artists that they really love and then they have to get more staff and then they start taking more films. Mm -hmm. And so I think you have to be real careful. Um, I would agree. And I was a sales agent for many years and I'll be the first person to tell you that not every film needs a sales agent. Um, my colleagues would probably be very upset if they heard me say that, but that's just, that's just the truth. I can't tell you how many times when I was a sales agent, um, I would have conversations with filmmakers who would come to me and, for example, they'd be like, well, I have an offer here. I have an offer here. You know, I want to go with one of them. Do I need to bring on an agent? And my response would be, no. Do you have a distribution attorney? yes, then that person can help negotiate on your behalf. And so there are just certain scenarios where um, if you already have relationships with buyers, if buyers have already declared, um, or if you're going a more non-traditional route with distribution, there are different ways to forego working with a sales agent. However, I will say that some filmmakers and some films really benefit from working with a sales agent because what you do get with a sales agent are really two main things and that's access and resources um, typically related to the industry. They have all of the relationships with from a very wide perspective with buyers. Um, so getting in contact with the right people really is pretty easy for them. And then the other part is, is they're negotiating deals on an hour by hour basis. So they really know in terms of market intel, what's fair, what's not fair, what's standard, et cetera they really have a good understanding of that. And so again, the two, the two big takeaways are not every movie needs a sales agent, but there are benefits that come along to working with a sales agent. And also I always really encourage people, um, there's a lot of sales agents out there. Everyone pretty much has this similar Rolodex and contacts and has been doing it for a while. And for that reason, I just really encourage filmmakers to pick the person who they vibe and get along the best mm -hmm. with. You are, this is another point in the process where you're getting into bed with someone for a long period of time. You know, if someone's a dick to you, but they seem super successful, and there's another person who's maybe not as successful, but you just really get along well with, I, I would sit with that mm -hmm. and make a decision on what makes the most sense for you. 
Okay, and um, Abby, could you share with us just a, a standard deal term uh, with a sales agent as far as percentages and? Yeah, I mean, it, most sales agents will work on a commission basis, yeah. uh, commission off the top of whatever deal, if there is an MG, if there is a license fee. Um, Typically, it's anywhere from 10 to 15% commission. However, I've been in scenarios before in the past where I've done it for less than 10. I've been in scenarios in the past where um, I've engaged in what's, what's called a co-representation um, scenario where it's myself and I'm selling with another sales agent. So we're splitting the commission. Uh, but typically, it's if you're between that 10 to 15%, that's a, that's a solid place to be. And again, negotiate with your sales agent on the commission. They will, they will come to you and say, my commission is flat. Um, it, it is what it is. But if you go back to them, you can always ask and have that negotiation and conversation with them. But don't they, uh, my experience is that they, like you said, their commission comes off the top, meaning they try not to take money out of the, the core budget of the film. So they're taking money out of the creative, so to speak. So isn't that your experience that it, it really it comes from the, the streaming service or the, whoever's paying for it pretty much? Correct. Yeah. Correct. So the, the commission comes off the sale. And right. so um, in the event that there are, there have been times in the past where I've worked on a year for a film and we were only able to get a no MG offer, which meant we didn't make any money on that. But mm -hmm. that's just kind of the risk that you take with, being a sales agent and working in the marketplace. So I, I've seen some deals recently with, with distributors, with distribution companies who are essentially saying, and this is for, for um, newer and smaller films, the distributors are saying what they're going to do is get, get the film onto you know, pitch to Netflix, Amazon, to the, the streamers and OTTs. So um, in that respect, they're, they're really serving as a sales agent, even though they're, they're taking, um, you know, it's a traditional distribution deal in that you're giving up the rights to the film to those companies. So is that something you're seeing that there is crossover between those two things? Are you talking about aggregators or are you talking yeah. about like the distributors oh. of the world where you pay a flat fee? Well, I guess distributors no longer, but the companies where you, where you pay a flat fee and then they pitch to all the streamers. Well, I guess both. What, what I had seen was, is it a traditional looking distribution agreement for really what they're going to do is they're going to try to get you on Netflix. And if they don't, they're going to put it on, uh, you know, maybe <laughs> just on prime um, yeah. or, or even YouTube. Yeah. Um, um, I, I can understand the parallel that you're making between what sales agents do and what the aggregators yeah. do, because it is a similar type of relationship. Um, but from an aggregator perspective, those are kind of like the no advance deals that I was just talking about where a buyer will come on board for no advance and they'll take your film under their wing and they have specific output deals with the different platforms. Therefore, the likelihood that your film not only will be pitched to those platforms, but will be picked up by their platforms is, is, is pretty, pretty good. Um, and so I do think that those deals, again, those deals, you don't necessarily have to have a sales agent to get access to those types of buyers. Those buyers are deals, um, and that is a good way in. If you're one of your, if one of your goals was like, I really just want it on Amazon Prime, I'm going to do my own marketing around it, and I just really want to push the audience there. Maybe an aggregator like that is going to be a better route for you than working with a sales agent who's going to go wide across the market to all buyers. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at our questions here. So the, a relevant question that just popped up was, so do, do you think, I, you might have just answered this, do you think you need a sales agent 
specifically to go to Netflix or Amazon and the streamers? Or is it helpful? I mean, I think it is, it can be helpful. If you don't have any relationship with Netflix or Amazon or anybody, if you're a newer filmmaker, um, it's almost impossible to get in the door there. So if you could meet and hook up with a sales agent, and if they, if it was the right kind of, if you vetted this person, like we talked, like Lewis talked about, and it was the right kind of a deal where you felt comfortable, um, then it would be worth maybe doing that because th those people have access to, you know, they'll, Netflix will take their phone call, their email, and they won't, from, I mean, I hate to say it, but they won't from you. Yeah. Uh, so that's a scenario where I think it could be, it could be very helpful. And you just have to, you know, look at the, the, the fee they're taking is coming hopefully out of the, the total sale. So it doesn't affect your budget for your film. That's usually what happens. Uh, I just wanted to pop back on because we've, we've gotten a couple of questions uh, on the same topic. Uh, Abby, uh, you've mentioned uh, a couple of times an MG, and I was wondering if you could define that for the attendees. Sure. An MG um, means minimum guarantee. You can also, you'll probably also hear the word advance used a lot instead of minimum guarantee. And it just means that it's a sum of money from a distributor that you're going to receive up front for purchasing your film. Um, obviously deals that have an MG attached to them are, are more desirable than what I was saying before, no MG, um, mm -hmm. deals where you're not getting any money up front. Um, but I always say there's no such thing as a bad offer. So even if you end up getting offers where they, you have a bunch of no MG offers, there's still different ways that you can negotiate those offers and different levers that you can you can push to make a no MG deal still very advantageous for you as a filmmaker. All right, we've got uh, a couple of other questions uh, sort of piling up over the, over the course of uh, the panel. So I think this is a perfect time for us to sort of dig into some of those. Uh, I, I think this is, uh, mostly directed to you, Brian, I, but I'd be happy to hear from everybody on this. Uh, so how do you shop for films during a pandemic? Uh, this viewer had heard about virtual markets in the past uh, and is curious about how that works. Sure, so um, the virtual market, well, w w I've attended one market and, and one festival so far. So the, the Marche, which is the, uh, the, the market associated with the Cannes Film Festival, uh, took place in, in June. And what Cannes did is they, they gave official Cannes designation uh, to a select group of titles um, that they're saying would have been in the festival had the festival taken place. And um, so those titles were generally available through streaming links to people who had registered with the Marche, the marketplace. And in addition to those, there, would, there were other films that weren't really under the umbrella of Cannes, but were being presented at the Marche. And, and those films generally are uh, available through sales agents um, or, or sometimes, um, you know, the producer themselves um, offers their film up for this digital streaming platform. And so we registered, um, we got the schedule, um, films became available in Chicago at a specific time. You had to log on and watch it then. Uh, and so it, it was basically as if you were there, you know, it's, I'd much rather be in, in Cannes than uh, in Chicago in, in, <laughs> in the middle of a pandemic. But it was very convenient. I mean, we, it, obviously we save money on, on travel, but we, we, we got to see many films. And one film we actually ended up purchasing um, out of that market. Um, someone mentioned earlier that in, uh, you, don't get that, you don't get that festival buzz. You don't get to see how a film plays with an audience. You don't get to meet critics and colleagues afterwards and kind of compare notes. Um, and that's really unfortunate. It makes it a lot harder to do our job. On the other hand, 
doing it remotely, you're a little more dispassionate. You know, you can maybe be a little more rational. I mean, don't get it, <laughs> it make some stupid mistakes um, in theory. Um, so, uh, so, and then Toronto just concluded, and this same thing there. There was some official Toronto titles, uh, and then there were uh, other titles that were just being shown under the Toronto on the Toronto digital platform. Um, you don't get a chance to meet with sales agents. Typically when we go to these markets, not only do we see a lot of films, but we meet with face to face for 20 minutes, uh, sales agent after sales agent. And they, they, sh they pitch to you what you can go see at the theater now playing at the festival, but they also tell you what's coming up, you know, what's, what's in pre-production, um, what's in post-production. Um, you can sometimes see a little trailer, um, just to, so, so you begin to track these projects. Um, so, you know, that's basically is what's happening now virtually, but you don't have the audience, uh, and the other, you don't have the one-on-one -on -one meetings as many. I, I still had some Zoom meetings, but, but not nearly the amount we had if it were in person. The last thing I'll say quickly is that it, even though these festivals and markets are taking place, you're not necessarily getting a lot of great new product. Uh, some, a lot of films were shut down, um, during the, 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 the the, during COVID and weren't able to be completed in time. Other films are completed, but sales agents are holding them back. They don't want to show, especially with the Marche, you know, it was the first time a market existed uh, during COVID virtually. And so it was a lot of risk there. Do, do you show uh, your, your A picture, your hot new title on this new platform? Um, will you get the best price for it if, if you show it that way? And so, some distributor or some sales agents and producers took the risk. Um, and for some of them, it paid off because they found that people were still anxious to buy. They still had a, a slate to fill out. They had a pipeline to fill. Um, other um, sales agents said, no, let's wait and see. Let's, maybe we'll hold it for Venice. Um, and so now what happened this fall is Venice, Toronto, Telluride, New York, they're all happening around the same time this fall. And what they've decided to do is share uh, not, not, not play politics and insist you must premiere here. You can't give it to that festival. They're, they're cooperating. And so there's a smaller number of titles because less is available. And those films are showing up on, in many different festivals, either in person or, or through a, a virtual festival. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks so much for that, Brian. Uh, and then, Jed, if you want to uh, ask a couple of questions, I, we're, we're getting towards like the last five, seven minutes of this. Uh, so if there's something uh, that we can talk about to sort of uh, yeah. complete this circle, <laughs> uh, I think that'd be great. Okay. You know, if I may, I, I'm afraid I do have to jump off right now, so I'm sorry I can't uh, hear the rest of the Q&A, but I'm reachable through the Music Box Films website uh, or Music Box Theater's website if anyone has any questions. Um, but thank you for this opportunity. Nice meeting you all. Thanks. Nice meeting you. Okay. Um... Uh, well, I see, I see quite a few questions from our attendees also. Um, <clears throat> all right. Hey, Jed, I have a question. Yeah. I have a quick one if you want to. Yeah, no, go ahead. Sorry, so we were ahead. Talk, yeah, <laughs> so we've, we've talked a lot about uh, sort of the technicalities and uh, mechanisms for distribution. Very interesting uh, comments about that. I'm sort of interested as a, not as a filmmaker myself in content. Um, are there themes or c different kinds of films, uh, uh, whether they're documentaries or narratives or, or whatever that, uh, you know, have a trend of, of, you know, now this is a, this is a, a kind of a hot area for this, this particular content, this subject matter um, is sort of hot or is it there's, is there a, um, a point where people get tired of that topic? Um, I'd be interested in, in the panelists' views on, um, you know, do, do most narratives or narrative films or documentaries have some kind of a social theme to them, or are they, um, I don't, 
I, I, mikvah, I thought, um, certainly has a political content to it and, and a personal one. But anyway, I'd be interested in sort of content-related uh, comments by the panelists. You know, it's not um, wife, swapping, wife swapping or purchasing drugs, but every filmmaker I know spends most of their time talking about who's buying what. You know, we hear Amazon's looking for, you know, um, historic episodics. Um, this company just bought this, and if they do well with it, they might be looking for more films in that vein. I mean, it's, it's not set. It, it, was, it used to be, in the heyday of the studio system, it was more set, you know, one of us going to do this kind of film, 20th Century Fox. But right now, it's market trending. You know, and so when Michael Moore and uh, uh, Denise, Denise D'Souza, and I spit when I say his name, because I have to, um, he is just the most intellectually dishonest person. Not the worst, but anyway. When those guys had hits, everybody was looking for political documentaries. You know, a coming of age story, everybody's looking for coming of age stories. Um, you know, original brilliant art can still be seen, but I, I, the people I know spend a lot of time handicapping who's looking for what kind of material. I will say- I would totally- Oh, oh go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to echo what you were saying, Lewis, that, that what I, I always give the advice to filmmakers, do not create for the market uh, because the market will change today and tomorrow and an hour, et cetera, et cetera. And so my advice that I always give people is the thing that will come through at a festival, through a sale, to an audience is story and character and passion for telling that story. So if, as long as you focus in that space, you're going to be at, on the right path. If you, to Lewis's point, if you get caught up in the, well, Netflix isn't doing anthologies right now, so I'm not going to do that. Or, you know, it's an election year, so I'm only going to do politics. Like, it's, it, you're inevitably going to find yourself in a spot where, oh, said buyer doesn't want that anymore. So what do you do next? Um, so just focus on character story and the passion behind it. Yeah, and I'll echo that. I mean, one thing that's been nice for for people like me that have always been, I make a lot of social issue documentaries is there's a much bigger appetite for social issue, social justice films. One thing that has changed though is instead of making a feature film, a 90 minute or a 60 minute documentary, uh, the trend obviously now is to do multi-part documentary series, could be three or four or five shows. And that is a different animal and, and that sometimes it's difficult uh, to to make that's just a lot more of your time and commitment and money and everything but that seems to be the trend and so you, you're we're constantly wrestling with that should this be a 90 minute feature because we believe that's all we we have to make or do we have enough material to make a three-part series in which case it's probably more saleable uh, to the streaming services so that's a I'd say that's a newer quirk that's developed over the past couple of years. Um, but I'm happy to see the appetite for social issue films because when I started making these kind of films in the eighties, it was just kind of like, there was nowhere to go. It was very hard to distribute a film about any social issue, very hard to get funding for them. And now um, it's almost flipped completely. So it's, it's that, that part is very heartwarming to me. But, and what Abby was saying, and this is the truth, you make the best film you can make. Yeah. You know, I mean, don't worry about the market. Don't worry about uh, accoutrements. You, you, the content is important. The way you make the film, you make the best film you can make. Because to worry about the other stuff is to you put the horse, you know, way behind the cart. Is that the right thing? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure it will enter our lexicon very soon, Lewis. <laughs> but I think, I think Abby's right. The passion is the main thing. By, you know, funders and distributors and producers sense your passion for a project. If you don't have that passion, it's, even if you fake it, it's not going to work. And so that is a crucial issue. And also I tell people, if, especially in documentaries, you're going to be probably working on a film for three or four or five years. If you don't have the passion... Mm -hmm. to, to pull that off and to keep pushing year after year after year, um, then that's, the film is not going to be successful. So I, I totally agree with you, Abby, on that. Well, we're um, 
couple minutes past uh, the hour, and uh, we promised a 60-minute program, so we're right on the money here. And um, I, I thought this was fantastic. Uh, thanks to all the panelists and to Jed, our great moderator. And um, we will, um, once we, we do record this, and once it's recorded um, and it's gone through a mild editing, uh, we will post the link um, on our website along with information about the panelists and our upcoming panels. Um, so be watching for that. Um, and uh, without, uh, with that, I think we are about to say leave. Hit the leave button. Great. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks again thanks to everybody. everybody. Thank, you. Thank you so much, everyone. Really interesting panel. Thanks.